morning, Catalyst Church. Welcome. We're excited that you're joining us this morning. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much. Lord, would you just bring your presence to wherever we are this morning. Lord, be with us, with our families and our homes. Lord, wherever we're at, we just invite you. We love you in your name and pray. Amen. Let's worship together. Come on. Treasure 
tears that fade are never enough That you came along Put me back together And every desire is now satisfied There's nothing, sing it out. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. And I'm not afraid to show you. Fair! 
God, we are so thankful that you're a God we can count on. A God that's not going to let us down. A God that's never going to leave us feeling alone. You're going to meet us right where we're at. You're going to help us with the battles we are fighting. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for loving us right where you have us and loving us enough not to leave us there. Loving us enough to grow us. Love enough, loving us enough to help us through. Dear God, we thank you for all that you do and who you are. We thank you for what you have forgiven us for. In your wonderful name, Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Catalyst Church. How are you doing today? Wherever you are, take a moment, look at the person next to you, and just remind them that you love them. No matter what happened this morning, no matter what was going on, just remind them that you love them. You're thankful to be with them. You're thankful to worship our Lord Jesus with them. Because at the end of the day, all of this is about the people that we get to do life with, the community that we're a part of. So just remind them that you're thankful for them. You're thankful to be a part of their circle. Oh, hey, good morning, Catalyst Church. So glad you could be with us today. If you're a guest, we are honored to have you with us. Take a moment if you wouldn't mind. You'll see the instructions on your screen there. Reach out to us. Let us know that you are with us today. We'd love to connect with you, help you to become a part of the Catalyst Church family. So you've probably heard the joke before. You know, it contends that, you know, the secret to comedy is all in the timing. But in truth, there's actually one step further back that marks a great comedian. They can bring you right along up to the edge of rudeness so you can touch it without getting your hands dirty. Comics often use humor, you know, to say what, you know, many people, most of us are thinking or maybe what we're feeling, but we don't necessarily always have the courage or even the clarity to give voice to those feelings. Comics will push the line of appropriateness, often exposing humor or exposing the irony in a situation. And truly, skillful comics are hilarious. Unskillful comics are offensive. You know, and of course, we have to admit it, there are some people who simply cannot see the humor in anything. Man, are they super fun at parties, right? You know, people who are just offended by everything, everything in their worldview has something wrong with it. They just, you know, these people, everything is simply unacceptable. You know, context usually is what marks the difference between the acceptable and unacceptable. For example, you'd likely say that, you know, I was acting inappropriately if I pushed your child in the street. But what if we're both in the street and I'm actually pushing your child out of the way of a bus? The context makes all the difference, doesn't it? Same exact action on my part, but a very different context, very different reasons behind my actions. We've been examining Paul's recipe for biblical love, which defies the normal definitions that the world tries to impose upon love. And in the more than just defying it, biblical love is actually an affront to the world's definitions. Last week, I had mentioned that persecution occurred in almost every community of Christ's followers as the gospel was moving into and throughout the Gentile world. Well, why is that? Because anyone who actually lives differently than their neighbors casts a light upon their neighbor's lifestyle. No one particularly likes to have their actions or choices or lifestyle attacked or exposed, even if the attack is at some, you know, is never voiced. It's never, you know, done intentionally. You know, for illustration, every choice that we make is inherently, at some levels, a choice against every other choice, or a statement against every other choice we could have made. Silly illustration. If I decide to buy a red car, I am making a statement against white cars at some way. Not, not a very powerful statement, probably. But what about when I decide to vote a certain way? 
I am undeniably making a statement against the other position at some level, aren't I? What about when my family decides to not participate in some otherwise common cultural practice? What if, and this isn't true for us, but let's just say, what if like you know, the, oh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, we decide not to celebrate birthdays or holidays in any way? Are we not making some sort of statement to those who do? Are we not, you know, whenever someone makes a, a, a decision different than our own, because of our personal insecurities, we often question whether they are making more than just a statement to us, they're making a statement about us. And now it gets dicey, doesn't it? Well, here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And take a moment, turn with me there if you would, because once again, Paul is including in a, another ingredient that you and I are to leave out of our recipe for love, our love for one another. And this one again is likely included in his list here because the Corinthian believers were failing miserably in their love within the community of faith. Let's pick it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient, kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. I'll stop there for now. Love is not rude. Paul says. The word he uses is askemaneo, askemaneo in the Greek, and it means to act unbecomingly. And it has tones of dishonoring or even disgracing. Dishonoring the other person. Rudeness. You know, without, without irony, I can tell you that I rarely get myself in trouble for things that I do. But I get in trouble for things that I say all the time. You know, as a connoisseur, I like to think of myself as a connoisseur of sarcasm. In all of its beauty and its majestic brilliance, I know the distinction between irony, sarcasm, humor, and rudeness. And I know that distinction all too well. I've learned through the school of hard knocks when too far is too far. I've made every mistake of rudeness known to man, and I've even invented a few new ones. You know, stated positively, the love that Paul desires for the Corinthian believers, arguably the same love that the Spirit of God desires to build in, in us, in you and I, is a courteous love. When he says it's not to be rude, he means it's to be courteous. The definition of courtesy is interesting. It means a behavior marked by polished manners or respect for others. Now, I don't know if I'm so concerned about polished manners in our biblical expressions of love for one another, but boy, that piece there, respect for others, that's huge, isn't it? Let's look at an incident in Jesus' life and ministry. Turn with me back to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. In Luke chapter 7, verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. Boy, you talk about a, an unremarkable opening to what's probably going to be a very remarkable evening. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard that Jesus was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts 
Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. Right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. She has shown me much love. The person who's forgiven little shows only little love. Powerful moment, actually. It was the discourtesy of Simon the Pharisee which Jesus remarks upon. Contrasted against the extravagant display of affection and honor from this woman. And, and as we see a moment later, Jesus is going to really offend the religious snobs by declaring this woman forgiven of her sins. It's not that hard to imagine Jesus basically, you know, almost saying to you know Simon, ooh, you're all flustered and verklempt that I'm allowing this supposedly unclean woman to touch my feet, you're really going to lose your religion when I tell her she's forgiven. Here's a pro tip. Tuck this one back in, into the, you know, the back of your mind somewhere. The religiously unloving sim simply cannot allow others to experience a freedom and a liberty they themselves do not experience. It's important that we recognize this. Not so we can you know, call them out in their legalism, but rather so we know how to pray for their own liberation from the prison of religion. So how do you and I, how can we infuse our love with a trait of courtesy? I've been saying throughout this entire Get Desophisticated series that Paul's recipe for love here includes choices, traits, and skills. Right now we're in kind of that traits portion. And we're looking at this courtesy. He says, don't be rude. I'm spinning to the positive. How do we infuse our love with courtesy? Well, the first thing I want to look at today, the first point that I want you to maybe write down, it's probably going to be a little shocking. It's this. Leave God out of it unless he's actually in it. Leave God out of it unless he is actually in it. It's a fun game that religious people play all the time, adding, you know, adding all sorts of things to Scripture, adding things to Christianity, adding extra rules or, or cultural practices, or better yet, expectations, which God never, himself never even placed on his followers. I saw an article during the, the last uh, you know, presidential election cycle, and it was entitled, Why Christians Must Vote Republican. I'll be honest, I didn't even read the article because the title tells me that the author has absolutely no clue. Had I Googled it, I didn't, but had I Googled it, I bet I could have immediately found an equally brilliant article entitled, Why Christians Must Vote Democrat. And I can even assume that they both would have invoked the same Bible verses, if any. Let me invoke a Bible verse here. The third commandment, you know, of the Ten Commandments, the third commandment found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, says this, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Maybe you've heard it in a more, you know, King James version, you know, that you, know, you shall not use the name of the Lord your God in vain. You know, taking the Lord's name in vain is not about swear words or yelling Jesus' full name whenever you smash your thumb with a hammer. Taking the Lord's name in vain means invoking his authority. 
or invoking his participation in something that he has not done so. Speaking the truth in love is kind of the New Testament version of that. All the time you've heard people say that. Maybe you've said it. Maybe you've had it thrown at you. I'm just speaking the truth in love, brother. Sister, I just want you to know in, in love, that has to be one of the most twisted scriptures ever employed by discourteous, unloving Christians. It gets thrown out when you're, as if it justifies someone's insensitivity or their lack of compassion or maybe just their utter laziness in trying to understand something that they don't understand. Paul uses it. Let's go there. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Oh, let's begin at verse 14. Paul writes, then we will no longer be like immature children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, here it is, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing, look at that, full of love. The context here is maturity of the body of Christ, especially in the face of false doctrines and false teachings. There will be times that we need to warn one another against falling prey to enticing false beliefs. That's what Paul does for most all of his writings in the New Testament. He's countering the false and the ruinous beliefs that are creeping into the theology of the fledgling church. He's exposing the lies and the, and the tactics of the enemy. He calls out false teachers, and he corrects mistaken beliefs, mistaken practices of the community of faith. And of course, there are times that you and I, we must speak difficult truths lovingly to one another. But I gotta tell you, if you feel the need to invoke Ephesians here, you're probably not actually operating in love. Invoking God's name, God's authority, it's a temptation we face. Usually when we aren't convinced ourselves of the truth. You know, recall what I said uh, last week about allowing our humble love to simply stand on the merits of itself, no need for fanfare, no need for explanation or defense. Well, courteous love, similarly, does not require the, the theological equivalent of the pinky swear or the cross my heart and hope to die. When it is real and when it is authentic on its own, courteous love doesn't need us to invoke God's name. You know, you've, you've no doubt heard this. You know, when, when someone gives God credit for their choices which run contrary to his revealed will in Scripture, Bobby and I have someone in our life who repeatedly makes stupid choices for herself. And every time it is wrapped in, God told me, or God is leading me, we're left feeling, no, absolutely not. She refuses to hear that. No matter how we, no matter how carefully we try to deliver that, she refuses to hear it. God told me. And we know that, no, he didn't. Because some of her choices are absolutely contrary to his revealed will in Scripture. Courteous love doesn't attempt to shut down questioning or challenging by slapping God said when he didn't say it. That's what I mean when I say leave God out of it unless he's actually in it. Because are there times that God has said? Absolutely. Listen, Catalyst Church, we are a Pentecostal fellowship, which simply means that we believe the Holy Spirit of God is free to do today what we see him do in Scripture. Nothing has changed for how the Holy Spirit operates in our midst. Will you translate that belief into daily life? And it means that we affirm fully that God speaks to you and I through Scripture. He leads us through our own spirit, those impressions deep within. 
our own emotions, our own conscience. He even, he even leads us through theology and doctrine. I know that'll make the religious people really happy, but yes, in truth, he does. Boy, here's an aside, I guess. While we're on the topic of the Holy Spirit leading, I have a sneaky hunch that we will need the immediacy of the Holy Spirit's leadership in our lives more and more in the, in the coming days and years. You know, when all this COVID stuff began way back when, what, 18 months ago, I don't know where it was now, I made the prediction, actually, that, that coming out of the pandemic would be one lasting feature, at least, and that, and that lasting feature is not masks. I made a prediction that one thing would come out of the pandemic and probably remain, and that is this, a widespread institutional mistrust. I believe that prediction was dead on accurate. It seems today no one fully trusts any authority any longer. From government to media to health agencies, to school boards, we all take, we take everything now with the assumption that there's an underlying agenda at best and more likely an underlying deception. Widespread institutional mistrust. Well, when you don't know whom to trust or where to turn for truth, that's a truly frightening state of existence. And people do frightening things when they are truly scared. But wait, Christ's followers have promised to them the direct and immediate guidance and leadership of God through his Holy Spirit. I think we're going to need the immediacy of the Holy Spirit's leadership and guidance as part of our skill set in a very big way. Come on, who survives when the plane crashes in the wilderness? It's the people who watched Bear Grylls and have their Swiss Army knife at the ready. I'm not going to reduce the Holy Spirit you know, to the spiritual equivalent of a survival knife. But learning to listen and discern what the Spirit of God is saying and doing at any given moment will, I predict, prove to be the difference that marks our lives in the coming years. And that was kind of a little bit off point. But truthfully, I think we need to be, learn to be sensitive to the Spirit's lead. Not blame God for the things that God didn't say, and also not waiting for Him to give us leadership on things that he has already given us leadership. If he's already revealed in Scripture what it is we're to be doing, you don't need to wait for some voice from heaven. You already got it. Which leads to the second point. The second, you know, to help us add this trait of courtesy in love. And that's really this. I said, you know, leave God out of it unless he's actually in it. The second is this. Leave ego out of it always. And this may also sound somewhat shocking at first, but courteous love is marked by a dispassionate calmness. Dispassionate calmness. It's kind of a, I don't care. Now, it's not the apathetic, I don't care. It's the, I, whatever happens, happens. It's the open hand. So often we infuse our interactions with one another with, extra helpings of our ego. We impose our opinions, we impose our experiences, our perceptions, even our expectations onto one another. And in our worst moments, we manipulate one another. Other times, we're just marketing ourselves to one another. I think one of the most powerful moments that I can think of in the New Testament when we see this emptying of ego is when Paul is languishing in prison. He's wrestling between his desire to continue proclaiming the gospel or resigning himself to his likely execution. And it's during this time that he writes his letter to the believers at Philippi. Turn with me, if you would, to the first chapter in Philippians. Chapter 1, verse 20. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ, so I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. 
but for your sakes it is better that I continue to live. And he goes on, knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Do you hear the dispassionate trust behind his words? Paul isn't saying he doesn't care. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying that what he desires, but he also surrenders that desire to God's will. Right now, our executive team here at Catalyst Church, we're going through a study together. Uh, and, and really, the whole point of it is actually we're charting out the future of Catalyst Church. You know, and we're learning some new skills in this process, new skills of discernment. You know, and one of those is called the prayer of indifference. And really, it's about divesting ourselves of the need for God's will to match our will, for God's will to match our wants or our expectations. And we've been learning it, and it's been a, a little bit of an uphill battle, I'll be honest. It, it hasn't been the easiest thing for us to learn to simply pray, Lord, what do you want? And almost like in parentheses, we have no wants. We're going to empty ourselves of the desires the predefinitions that we bring to this. We simply want what you want. Help us to not care what you tell us, but simply submit to what you tell us. It's been a challenge, to be honest. You know, you know when Jesus gave his disciples the model and the example of the Lord's Prayer, he was careful to include that all-important phrase, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because courteous love doesn't need to be right. Courteous love doesn't need to be obeyed. Courteous love doesn't need to get its own way or impose its own agenda on others. Courteous love trusts the Holy Spirit to do the heavy lifting of convincing others if they need to be convinced at all. You know, I, I can recall a few years ago I shared uh, something that, you know, it was in a message, and I, it was something that had been giving me a great amount of freedom, actually, and relieving me of a self-imposed pressure to convince others to join the bill side of the force, whatever, you know, really to, to, to meet me in my perspective. In my, I was feeling a freedom from that. It was a realization that I've, you know, since repeated to myself over and over and over, somewhere around 42 trillion times, and I believe it actually has greatly improved my relationships you know, with others, I think, and just as important, it has helped me grow in a dispassionate, trusting, courteous love. At least I think it has. And it was a statement. Again, I've repeated it to myself so many times. There is nothing in my faith which requires me to require you to believe as I believe. Let me say that again. There is nothing in my faith which requires me to require you to believe as I believe. For me, it was a moment when the Holy Spirit helped me to open my hands. Instead of holding on to, I need people to think this way, believe this way, act this way. No, I don't. I need me to behave, act, think, believe a certain way, but I don't need them to. Courteous love sounds and acts differently than discourteous, rude love. Courteous love declares, but it does not dictate. Courteous love shares, but it does not shame. Courteous love informs, but does not impose. Courteous love accepts, even when it cannot condone. Courteous love trusts the heart and the dignity of one another. It doesn't trample it. So as we close, I want to return to the same passage that we looked at last week in Paul's letter to the Philippians. You're already there. When we saw Jesus' example of humble love, let's look at that entire passage. Philippians 2, beginning of verse 1. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, 
loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor, gave him the name above all other names, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice how Paul ties the death of Jesus on the cross to his example of love. Jesus provided for our salvation, and he exemplified for us what love can look like. I'll even contend what love needs to look like. The world is desperately in need of true, authentic, sincere love. But let me take it out of the abstract. Let's, let's not worry about the world right now. Your neighbor, you know what they look like. You know their name. You know what, their, what color of their car they chose. They need desperately authentic, real, courteous love. Your family members, they need a real, authentic, humble, courteous love. Co-workers, the person at the desk next to you, cubicle next to you, workbench next to you, whatever it is, they need a real, authentic, kind, patient, humble, courteous love. Let's not worry about the world right now. Let's worry about the very specific individuals that Jesus has put in your life desperately need love. They don't need fancy anything. They need real, authentic, sincere, not perfect, not polished, just real. If you have experienced that, then I encourage you, share it lavishly. If you have not experienced that, I want to invite you into that relationship into that love relationship with the very Son of God. That's what Jesus dying on the cross is really all about, so that you could have that relationship with the Father. It's as simple as asking him to come into your life, come into your heart, your mind, forgive you of your sin, make you new. Let's do that now. Pray with me if you would. Father, I thank you for the free gift of salvation. Because your son died on the cross, I can have a relationship with you. Thank you for that forgiveness. I ask humbly for your forgiveness of my sin. Wash me, cleanse me, make me new again. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You pray that prayer sincerely, authentically. It's not the words that are magic, it's the feeling. It's the heart sincerity that matters most to the Father. When we pray that way, Scripture is clear that we are a brand new creation in Christ. We are saved. We are a child of God. We want to celebrate with you. You'll see some instructions on your screen there. If you made that decision today, please let us know so that we can reach out to you and help you in your first steps. We have some resources we'd love to send your way. On behalf of all of us here at Catalyst Church, I challenge you to go into a courteous week in Jesus' name. Have a great week. Love you. We'll see you again here soon at Catalyst Church.